threat assessments. This is some extra material for class four. Uh, if I had my druthers, the textbook would have an entire chapter just dealing with how to evaluate threats, how to define threats, how to find publicly available information to determine which threats are relevant to your organization, how to review your own internal information to do this and so on. But unfortunately, the textbook, as well as other sources, tends to treat threats as something that's fairly obvious, as a threat is a threat, and you know what it is, and you know which ones are relevant or not. I think we require a bit of additional attention covering both the textbook and in this documents, as well as other information, to go over the best methods as a security professional to find out what is a threat and to evaluate the severity of a threat and the type of threat textbook summary. Here's what the textbook covers here. Their definition of threat is an event, either an action or an inaction. It leads to a negative or unwanted situation. The text also calls for creation of an organization-wide threat catalog. As a security professional, you're not just looking at a particular assessment or at a small piece of the organization. It is extraordinarily useful and, you know, essential for managing security overall to have a catalog of the actual and potential threats an organization faces with information about the capabilities of the threats, the degree to which these threats are targeting your organization, and what sorts of vulnerabilities the threats may take advantage of. You want to combine your threat catalog with a vulnerability catalog. You want to be able to match threats with the vulnerabilities for a particular vulnerability your organization may have. What threats will try to take advantage of that? Because this is a key to a risk assessment. It's not just who is out to get you. It's what weaknesses you have that may allow them to actually get you. The threat catalog. It's a comprehensive list of threats relevant to your organization. And you can build your catalog starting with existing comprehensive lists. Uh, looking at these, evaluating these, figuring out which threats are actually relevant to your organization, which aren't, uh, which ones you need to define further, etc. You know, go to publicly available lists of threats and then uh, ascertain which ones you need to be worried about. And here are some places you may look at per the text. The bits calculator. Good luck at finding this one. It's a financial industry group. Actually, BITS is a financial inst industry group known for developing a standard security practices questionnaire, the SIG or Standard Information Gathering document. The calculator, as mentioned, was published sometime around 2004. I've looked and I've looked and I can find no evidence of the threat calculator. Now, Microsoft has a very good threat model. The Microsoft Threat Analysis Tool is very good at analyzing potential security issues during application development. It's specifically designed for application development. It's free and relies on MS Visio. It's out of scope for this class, but you're encouraged to investigate it. You know, Microsoft also has a lot of other materials about threat analysis, and you know, there's good stuff there too. <coughs> NIST SP-830 Appendix DNF. Use these for the class project. We'll talk a bit more about them later, but these are very good. ISO 27005 Appendix C, and here's the link for it. Uh, this has also got a good list of threats, as well as the BSI Base IT Security Manual, a German-based document. So these are all things that you can use when you're developing your threat catalog. They can give you ideas as to what sort of threats to look at, definitions of those threats, and uh, additional information about them to prioritize them and categorize them. Your threat catalog should at least include potential threat agents, meaning the actors behind the threats, as well as the actions, the things may, they may do to realize a threat, to do whatever sort of bad deeds they might do to your organization. Now the textbook summary, the conclusion we make is, it does provide you the basics in itemizing and evaluating threats. You know, the textbook is okay here. You know, there's some very basic information here that you can use, but we still need more to do a proper assessment. So let's look at NIST SP 830. The definition of a threat is any circumstance or event with the potential to adversely impact organizational operations and assets, individuals, other organizations, or the nation through an information system via unauthorized access, destruction, disclosure, or modification of information and or denial of service. Summarizing, 
a threat is something bad. Now, there are some additional definitions in this that I think are very good that you need to keep in mind. First is you've got a threat event. It's an event caused by a threat source. It's a sequence of action and activities that the threat source initiates to exploit a vulnerability to achieve the threat source's goal. The threat source, and there's two types of these. It's an intent, intent or method targeting a vulnerability, <coughs> or it's a situation or method that inadvertently exploits a vulnerability. So there's an intentional threat source and an unintentional, an accidental or natural threat source. And keep this in mind because NIST, I think, to their credit, distinguishes these two because the two dis different types of threat source require different ways of analysis. A threat scenario is a set of threats from one or more related threat sources organized in time. Uh, a scenario is stuff that may happen as a result of a threat scenario initiating activities against your organization. And then we've got threat shifting, adversaries adapting to countermeasures and modifying their, <coughs> their behavior to bypass new controls. So this is a difference with intentional threat agents is they can see that you're trying to frustrate them by putting controls in place, by blocking them. So they will imply their own intentionality and intelligence to get around those blocks, whereas unintentional or natural threat sources don't do this. Now, the type of threats, events, and the level of detail required is determined during the scoping. What sorts of threat events you need to be concerned about and how much detail you need to describe them is part of the scoping of an assessment. What types of threat sources are also defined during scoping? So scoping, basically you need to focus in on threat sources and threat events that are most relevant to you. The sources of threat information are then defined. You can get this information internally from prior assessments or externally from various organizations that perform threat resource. Now let's look at Appendix D, the threat sources. Tab there's a number of tables in this section that are um, of interest. Table D1 maps information source by organizational tier, meaning what source was the, uh, what tier was the source defined in versus where are we doing the assessment. Threat sources defined in one tier may be used in assessments in another. And here's a description of the tiers. Organization, mission, business processes, information systems. You could be doing an information systems threat assessment, for example, and you may use threat sources that are defined at a tier one or tier two assessment previously, and you need to map those to the level you're actually working on. Appendix D threat sources. Other tables include table D2 is a threat list of threat sources. Table D3 helps you scale or evaluate the capability of your intentional adversary. How good are they at attacking you? Table D4 helps scale the intended damage the adversary seeks to cause. How badly do they want to damage your organization? What do they wish to accomplish and how? D5 scales the extent the adversary is targeting your organization. Are they just going for whoever they can get? Or do they have some specific reason to go after your organization? Is this just an adversary that's got a very broad and shallow reach that just wants to get someone who falls for their scam? Or is this somebody who knows your organization has something really valuable and is going after your organization and is putting a lot of resources into targeting you specifically? Table D6 scales the actual impact of the adversary activity, meaning you look at D4, which is what they want to do, and then you look at what they actually can do, and that gives you D6. And then lastly, D7 and D8 are templates that use to list and rank the threat sources. This is what you'll be using in the assignment. D2 through D6 helps you develop D7 and D8. Now, Appendix E deals with threat events. Appendix D deals with threat sources, okay? But they, they, they look kind of similar. E1 maps the information source by organizational tier to assessment tier, just like D1. You can have threat events and threat sources at one tier that you're evaluating at a different one. E2 provides a very comprehensive and useful list of adversarial threat events. Please review this list for the class assignment. 
E3 provides a similar listing for non-adversarial events. Again, you know, review this. It's really good. E4 categorizes relevance of threat events. How relevant are they to your organization? And then lastly, E5 is actually a template. This is what you need to fill out to report the threat event information in your risk assessment. And here's a summary of this. Appendix D threat sources and Appendix E. These events are used in task 2.2 in this overview process for SP 830. That's 2.2. Identify threat sources and event under step two, conduct assessment. So we're out of the first step in the conduct assessment of the NIST methodology here. Now, where do we find threat information? You can find it from prior reports and audits. There have been risk assessments hopefully done in your organization before. There have been folks, internal auditors, external auditors, people just doing assessments and so forth who may report back on threats. There's operational data, data that's gathered through the day-to-day -day operation of your network and your systems may give you clues as to who is targeting and how they are targeting your organization. You know, if you see, for example, a lot of folks uh, going after your website, attempting to execute SQL injection or cross-site scripting, that gives you some idea of the sorts of threat events you may need to be concerned about. There is peer information sharing you know, looking at folks in businesses similar to yourself and cooperating with them to share information about the common threat environment. And then there's published resource research that isn't so much dealing with your specific industry so much as it is just general off the shelf documents that tell you here's what's going on. Now, operational data includes antivirus events. Most enterprise organizations have antivirus installed on desktop machines as well as potentially on servers. And this antivirus is centrally managed, which means you should be able to run reports from the central management station that tell you what's being found, what sort of viruses are being cleaned on desktops and so forth. This can give you good information about potential threats. Uh, are the viruses things that are just uh, a shotgun approach, you know, where it's just a kind of a random piece of malware somebody happens to find that isn't specifically targeting your organization? Or is it a type of malware that looks like it's designed to exploit your own organization? This is something that antivirus can tell you about. Trends in AV can be helpful too. You know, knowing what sorts of bad software is out there and how often it's hitting you gives you some idea of threat events of that sort. Intrusion detection, intrusion prevention events based on network traffic attacks against key servers. You can find out what sort of events fit various known signatures of attacks. And hopefully your intrusion prevention system is deflecting these attacks, but the statistics are very important to know because it tells you what you're looking at in the outside world. And if something changes so that an attack gets past the IPS, you may be having some trouble there. Firewall logs tend to deal with more basic network events. You'll find things like port scans or attempt to connect to services that you don't really offer through a firewall log. You know, for example, there may be adversaries that are just doing a scattershot scan of voice over IP servers, of SIP services. And you may not be offering these services now, so your firewall logs just say, hey, this is denied. But if someone, for example, Say someone in a sales organization decides there's this really cool product that ties in with VoIP and they want you to open up this port, knowing you've got these scans will really help you create an argument that this service needs to be secured before you approve it. Mail server logs will tell you, you know, what sort of email you're receiving, what you're sending. Most organizations have block lists to prevent spam, to prevent phishing. You know, known bad email, badly formed email, email from addresses that has no business uh, talking to your organization and so forth. Look at these as well because they, again, are indications of threat events and potentially threat sources. Service desk events and incidents, things that your users report to your service desk saying, I noticed something funny with my computer or I got this funny email. Phishing attempts, your users should be educated to report email that is bogus but is attempting to extract information from them to the service desk to report this. Summarizing this, looking at trends in this, seeing if it's targeted to your organization or not is very useful. 
There's also other indicators of attack users may report, you know, anomalous activities in her desktop, problems logging into uh, servers or applications, etc. may also be indicators that, you know, somebody is trying to do something to your organization. The last thing I'm going to mention is honeypots, and these are devices that are specifically set up to entrap threat agents to gather information about threat events generated by threat sources. A honeypot is a server to the, that to the outside world looks legitimate and looks very tempting, but in fact um, is just a simulation of a server and is there to gather information about attacks. You would typically put a honeypot up on one of your public IP addresses that isn't used for anything else and that no legitimate party has any business accessing because an attacker will scan your IP uh, space, find this device and say, okay, I'm gonna probe this and see if I can hack into their network. And what you're actually doing is recording these hacking attempts. And honeypots can provide you with invaluable information about who's trying to attack you, what tools they're using, and what they're trying to uh, get from you. Now, peer information sharing. You've got informal contacts with other security professionals. You know, if you're a security professional, I strongly advise you join organizations, you chat with folks, and consistent with your own organization's confidentiality practices, uh, share information about the things that are going on and see if there's some common threats that are occurring that other folks in your industry are, are noticing as well, because these are things you might want to find out about. The SANS Internet Storm Center. This is a specific service set up by SANS. It is free analysis and warning service to thousands of internet users and organizations. What this Internet Storm Center does is it receives log files from folks who subscribe to their services, takes these log files, reviews them, summarizes them, and then publishes the aggregate up there. Uh, if you are being, say, attacked or swept by an external IP address, you put that IP address into the SANS Internet Storm Center, and it'll not only tell you who owns that address and other information about it, but it'll also tell you if any of their subscribers have noticed this IP address attacking them. The fact that someone has tried to attack someone else means that they may be more of a danger than otherwise. Information sharing and analysis centers for various industry sectors are set up by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security as a way of getting folks in critical industries and critical sectors to share information about security threats. ISECs collect, analyze, and disseminate actionable threat information to their members and provide members with tools to mitigate risk and, enha and enhance resiliency. ISECs are organizations which or which Folks in a particular sector may join. There are Isaacs for financial services, for energy and gas, for local government, uh, things like that. If your organization is in one of these sectors, you know, you should definitely join an Isaac. Isaacs have um, web pages, portals that list information about threats and useful information pertaining to security about your sector. They hold conferences and seminars. Uh, in the case of the financial services one, they hold bi-weekly phone conferences to keep people informed as to what sort of activity is being seen, you know, what sort of malware is being used to uh, attack organizations, what are the parties behind this malware, are there intrusion prevention signatures for the malware, what do you need to look for, What what is the intent of the threat agent. ISACs, if you can join one, are very useful for this. Publish resource and commercial research and commercial sources. I'll just go through a few of these. Alien Vault has an open threat intelligence service that you can subscribe to. Various vendors provide reports, Verizon, Symantec, IBM Dell, and other vendors. You generally have to register, give them your email address, expect to get a certain amount of marketing uh, spam from them, but their reports are very useful. They, they talk about what the trends are, who the threat agents and the threat sources are, what the various threat events that are being seen are about, you know, what threats are becoming more common, who is being attacked, and so forth. So they're, they're pretty good, and these are things that you should look into and research regularly. Now, a caution here is vendors may cease providing products and services, may go bankrupt, may merge with other vendors, 
may just mysteriously disappear for no reason. So just because I mentioned Verizon, Symantec, IBM, and Dell doesn't mean that by the time you get this lecture, these folks are still actually publishing anything useful. And that's it. This is it for threat analysis, sources of information, and what you can do with that sort of uh, information.